Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Outbreak Management Advisory Board and our latest meeting. I'd like to welcome all the participants and, and board members. Your time is much appreciated, uh, and also any members of the uh, public that are watching uh, the board this evening. Um, obviously, the, the, the live stream will be available after the meeting uh, for people to, to look at. We do have approximate timings uh, for tonight's meeting because it is a really long agenda. Uh, but even uh, with that and best endeavours, I apologise if we go slight, slightly off the, the timings that, that I've got, but hopefully we'll, we'll stick to them as close as possible. Um, I'd firstly like to do uh, introductions, welcome and apologies. Uh, and we have received a couple of apologies. So I'm going to hand over to Tracy Wallace uh, to take us through the apologies that we've received. Uh, Tracy. Um, okay, we have apologies from Sean Balsam at Healthwatch, uh, Mark Binterman at First York, Phil Metham from the Clinical Commissioning Group, uh, Julia Mulligan from the Police and Crime Commissioner's Office, Simon Padfield from Public Health England substituting, um, from Sharon Stoltz and Fiona Phillips is substituting, and lastly from Lisa Winwood and Phil Kane is substituting. Thank you very much, Tracy. Uh, it should, should be said that Tracy's not got her video on because of connectivity issues, and I did I, I did lose you for one of those, which I believe will have been apologies from Councillor Runciman uh, with Councillor Widdison uh, substituting. So uh, welcome to, to Paula and to Phil uh, attending their first meeting, uh, and, and indeed everybody else for, for coming back uh, for your subsequent meetings. That, that's appreciated. Um, the next item is declarations of interest. So I, I'd like to ask if anybody has any declarations of interest in relation to items on the agenda. If you do, if you could raise your virtual hands, although uh, people at home won't be able to see that, I'll obviously know to, to bring you in um, if obviously you want to raise anything now or on a future agenda item. Um, I can't see any, so we'll say that there are no uh, declarations of interest to record. Um, that then brings us on to agenda item two, which is the minutes of the meeting that we held on the 13th of July. And I'd like to ask board members if they're happy to, to sign off the minutes or if they have any matters arising. Um, and they'll have seen um, with the papers that have been published that the minutes have been transferred into an action log. And it's been attached here for the first time um, and includes the most up to date information at the, the time the papers were, were written. But I hope that that action log is going to be a useful way of the board keeping track of any actions that we've asked for as a result of our meeting. Um, so are there firstly any matters arising uh, from the minutes? And if not, if I could have a, a show of hands, and it would be good enough to, to move a hand at the screen, if you're happy for us to accept those minutes, please. Thank you very much. So I can see a clear, a clear majority of people attending in favour of accepting those uh, minutes from the last meeting. Um, action, uh, the next agenda item is, is number three, which is the current situation in York. And Fiona Phillips, our Assistant Director uh, of Public Health, is going to uh, present a snapshot, I understand, of the current situation in York. Um, and he's very happy to take any questions from, from board members afterwards. Fiona. Thank you. So, yes, yeah, so hopefully you've all seen um, the one side uh, within the agenda papers that gives uh, an update on where we are at the moment. So I'll just quickly run through some of the highlights from there. So uh, we have 938 confirmed cases in York. Um, our rate of infection is lower both than the England and regional averages. Uh, what that means for us in York is that we see around about four new cases cases being diagnosed per week in York. Um, our positivity rate, in terms, so that's in terms of all the tests that are carried out, uh, the proportion that come back with a positive result is 0.4%. And again, that's a lower rate than we see nationally and also in England. We have to date had 171 deaths of our residents. Um, and whilst that is a lower overall death rate um, than we've seen in England, uh, we have had a higher proportion of those that have occurred within um, our care home residents. 
What we've done in the update um, this time is to give a bit more detail of how the impact of COVID has been felt um, in terms of some of the demographics within our city, so age, gender and ethnicity. Um, so we've outlined that detail there. Uh, I think one of the things to highlight um, in there is that we've only fairly recently been receiving that much more detailed um, information. So we've given you some averages um, in terms of, of age, for example. As we get more of this data, we'll be able to start looking at some of the trends over time and is the sort of you know age group being affected by COVID changing as we move through the pandemic. But as I say, because we've only fairly recently had access to that data, um, we've not been able to do that as yet. And then I think the other bit to mention on that um, in terms of ethnicity, we are getting ethnicity data um, in terms of cases now. But it's worth noting that about 25% of, of cases, ethnicity is not recorded. So we are still um, raising that issue up um, through the various agencies to central government and um, that that needs to be improved in order that we can um, make sure we're given the necessary response. So we, you know, we want that to be um, better data that we're getting. Um, then further down on that page, um, you can see um, the kind of shape of the uh, the pandemic as it's affected York in terms of the curve there. And, and as you'll see, um, obviously our peak in York was in May. And at the moment, we're not seeing any increases or spikes in cases. It's, it's remained at a very static low level um, of cases. Um, we've also put in some of the data that we receive from the National Test and Trace Service in terms of the numbers of um, cases that they've been able to contact and then how many contacts uh, that has identified that they have been able to follow up. Um, so that's another area that we know needs improving and there are lots of discussions happening both locally but also at a national level in terms of um, how that national track and trace program is going to be improved and how it can work more closely with local areas so that where people uh, who the national service are unable to follow up we um, could potentially do some of that work at a local level with our expertise and contacts that we have in local areas uh, so that's a very um, quick run through but um, happy to take any questions that board members have thank you very much uh, Fiona and I can see that Ian has um, been the first to raise a virtual hand and then I'll come to Alison Ian yeah, thanks, Keith. It was just to add to what Fiona said, really, in terms of um, position from the council. Um, and I think, um, as Fiona said, the cases have been higher in West Yorkshire, quite significantly higher. Um, I think they are starting to make some progress there. But I think the issue for ourselves is clearly we haven't seen any of that actually come or spread out to ourselves. And so I think you know, that is all credit actually to those authorities who have been affected by that. And I know a lot of work has gone on in those areas. Um, and also clearly, you know, public health teams across the region really working together. And certainly the data is much stronger. I think that's coming out than it was, say, a couple of months ago. The other thing I think just to mention is um, just in terms of our overall recovery process and the issue that has in terms of potential further risks. Um, we obviously have been still putting out a lot of comms messaging and Claire will probably pick up a bit of that later on in terms of the messaging and we'll continue to do that and continue to promote the need for everybody to be very careful and exercise caution. Um, but we are seeing actually we have seen some positive signs certainly in the city centre in terms of people returning to the city. Um, you know, numbers, for example, in terms of car parking are holding up quite well. Um, visitors into the city and the, the you know, the, the numbers in terms of footfall are strong. And certainly from what we are hearing, stronger than most parts around the UK. But even with that, we haven't seen any, you know, noticeable increase in terms of cases. And so I think that's, that's all positive. 
but we absolutely you know we all need to do what we can to keep the messaging going out that clearly we're not over this the risk is still there and certainly as a council we absolutely will continue to put that messaging out thank you very much um, Ian and to Alison Hi, uh, my question is about the, the Bain communities again. So I know we don't have comprehensive figures, but we are still seeing disproportionate impact on people from the Bain communities. So do we have plans? Have we developed any plans in York in order to, to provide the support? So, you know, when things do start to get worse again, we've got, we've got plans in place to, to reach those communities. Yeah, so um, within the our outbreak control plan, one of our themes is um, around vulnerable populations. Uh, so um, we are doing work to look at, A, how do we get the messages out to people about the measures that they need to take in order to keep themselves safe and make, but make sure that those messages are accessible to all groups, not just those who, you know, follow the usual sort of um methods of communicating um, and also to make sure that we get those messages out around how do people access support so if they are um, if they do have symptoms and they're having to self-isolate and um, that they know that they can get support if they need help with shopping or other things if they are self-isolating so that support to the vulnerable is one of the key themes within the outbreak control plan so there's a lot of work going ongoing with that also linking into you know some of the work that we've already done um, in terms of our volunteering capacity um, that we have so it's it's a uh, it's a work in progress certainly um but you know there's a there's a lot of activity going on there thank you very much and i'm sure that's something that presumably fiona you'll you'll update us on at the next board as part of that current situation report and obviously whether we get any more or improved data over time yeah we'll do and then, then just a final question from me, you'd, you'd mentioned about um, gradually developing um, a local version um, of the uh, test and, and trace system. Um, whether you wanted to say anything more about the lobbying that I know that colleagues have been doing in professional associations and the local government association to try and get local authorities more data and quicker data um, to enable those who aren't just in those uh, areas that have additional restrictions can, can actually enable our public health teams to, to do their jobs? Yeah, so um, it's, it is a constantly changing um, situation. So Bradford and Calderdale councils have been piloting and um, doing just that and working with the national service. So um, that is being piloted and we are um, hearing down from uh, centrally that you know they will look to roll that out and will look to put resource into local areas to uh, enable all areas to be able to do that. So um, things are changing. Um, we don't quite know all the detail of how that will work at the moment, but it's certainly moving um, at quite a pace now. Thank you very much. I can't see any other hands for, for questions. Um, so in a sense, all we're being asked to do is note the report on the current situation in York. So I won't ask you to, to indicate on, on that, but thank you, Fiona, for the, the update. Obviously look forward to, to, to hearing it at further meetings. Um, that then takes us on to uh, agenda item four, which is the communications and engagement update. Uh, and I know Claire's gonna take us through some of the, the work done to today and the plans for the future, Claire. Thank you. Um, Chris, you said you'd be able to thank you very much, for star. So um, I'll be walking you through um, the outbreak control communications plan, the work we've done to date, our key messages and the incident communications plan, which obviously um, supports the outbreak control plan communications plan itself um, just to move you on to the next slide which basically says exactly what I've just said so we're sharing the outbreak communications plan big messages we'll keep reinforcing those messages always because we're going to keep to the big four to keep things simple um, communications update are where we've got to over the past month and then the incident communications plan next slide please Chris so um, the outbreak management communications, and you'll, re you'll remember this from the outbreak control plan itself, is in three phases. We want to prevent 
a further outbreak, and that will be through providing updates about the current situation. We want to respond to any changes um, and ramp up activity if things look like they're heading in a certain direction. And then should the worst happen, we want to be ready to manage the outbreak using our incident communications plan. Next slide, please, Chris. So our communications plan. Now, this is the one for outbreak control phase one and phase two. And essentially, it's around um, sharing accurate and timely information, um, building advocacy, building confidence in the steps we propose taking um, and letting people know what they need to do and building engagement through conversation. Um, we want people to, to know what they need to do, uh, to feel that we're taking a consistent and timely approach and working with your good selves and with partners to do that. And that, um, that people are able to both share the information and know what they need to do. And we'll come on to whether people know what they need to do um, shortly. Next slide, please. So um, there's a number of different things that we're going to be doing and have done, which you will have already in some cases experienced. So for example, um, Fiona just run through the weekly case information that we share on the open data platform. We send um, briefs updates twice a week to um, various different stakeholder groups, um, including partners, members, MPs, parish councillors. Um, we send information to residents twice a week through opt-in e-newsletters and through to business bulletins. And they are all always, at least in one article, reinforcing um, our four key messages. Often there are several um, messages around what we need to do and how things are changing to make sure we, we mitigate any um, outbreak peak or spike. Um, obviously, we update people via this, uh, this webcast every three weeks. We have a wraparound PR for the local media every week. So that's on every Friday. We do some sort of public health messaging to um, the local media. More recently, that's been around how we can safely shop locally. Um, that will move on as we go through the um, course of autumn. Um, we provide a weekly public health video. Um, we update provide updates in our city and we're currently producing an our city for distribution early September which will actually encourage people to essentially a series of top 10 tips on how to avoid local lockdown so really reinforcing the things that people can do um, and borrowing that content really from East Riding so thanks to East Riding for producing producing that um, we're going to be building confidence in the steps that people are taking by updating our web pages continuing to repeat those four key messages um, providing partner packs, um, make sure we've got Let's Be Your campaign material readily available, which is our out of um, home signage posters, adverts take all across the city, um, sharing our test and trace figures. In the event of a lockdown, any lockdown, whether that's a local setting or a um, citywide, we've got a instant communications plan that we'll come on to at the end of this brief session. And then um, we are running, uh, to build engagement through conversation, we're running quarterly temperature checks and we'll be bringing back how people feel about the information that they're receiving and whether they know what to do with a full report at the end of August. And I'll give you some um, headlines. So right now, pulling off the data that we've received today, which is about four weeks worth of um, um, respondents, 99% of people are confident they know what to do if they experience the symptoms, which is fantastic. 98% um, of people know what to do if they have the symptoms. And 95% of people are confident about the social distancing guidance, which again is really strong that people understand what to do if they feel they've got it and what to do to stay, stay separate from each other. Where we've, where we've got some um, more challenging data is that currently 54% of people are less confident about who they can socialise with. And I think that's reflective of how that's changed over the course of the last few months. Um, less confident about uh, rules in terms of returning to work. So, of course, there's lots of messages going on about getting civil servants and public servants back to work. Yet, as we know, many people are choosing to stay working from home. Um, less confident about what journeys they can make safely, with people saying they are somewhat confident, but not overly or extremely confident. Um, Interestingly, 81% of people say they understand government advice compared to 84% understanding council advice, which is quite encouraging. Um, 
with only 50% either extremely or very confident in that advice in both instances. So there's still work to be done. Um, and having an insight into what people are feeling and what where, where they feel there are challenges around our communications is really important to us. And like I said, we'll be bringing back a report about what people have told us um, at our next session. And we'll also bring a set of recommendations about what we might want to do collectively and from a council perspective to change that. Something that has come out of the um, the temperature check is actually people are feeling um, less emotionally resilient than they were pre-pandemic, pre um, with 32% feeling less physically healthy. So there are wider health impacts that are coming out and coming to the fore that we will need to look at and we will obviously work with partners on to see how we can address that. But like I say, the full report with recommendations will come back um, towards the end of August in our next meeting. Um, could you move on to the next slide, please? Chris, thank you. So we're in we're in phase one. I've just explained the information that's ongoing. Um, phase two is pretty similar to what we're what we've already done, although ramping that up and targeting that at special um, interest groups, for example, if if we believe that um, settings are heading the wrong way, or we think that schools need extra support or different community groups, then we'll target them with um, more information. And then finally, if we get into managing an outbreak, we will initiate our instant comms plan. Um, I'll briefly share that with you because obviously we're not in an incident right now, so we don't need to go into too much information. Um, but I'll briefly share with you that at the end of this um, short presentation. And it's probably worth noting that the head of comms group, which meets monthly, will be reviewing the incident comms plan in our next session in uh, mid-September. Fortunately, I think we've just lost Claire in in mid flow. There, we'll give we'll give her a few seconds to see if it kicks back in. If not, it might be best if you could close the presentation for now. And what what I'll do is. I'll go on to the next agenda item, and then if Claire kicks back in shortly, we can then go back uh, and pick up from where she was was up to on that incident plan. So we won't sign off the recommendations on communications. Hopefully, Claire will get back in the meeting and we'll come back. Uh, but for now, we'll move on to agenda item five, which is the update from the subgroup on universities and higher education establishments. Uh, and Charlie's going to uh, present this to us. Um, Charlie. Thank you very much, uh, Keith. Um, uh, last time we, we resolved to establish a subgroup of this board uh, to think about the particular challenges um, of uh, preventing and, and, if necessary, managing uh, COVID in university and college settings. Uh, that group has now uh, met, I think, three times, but it's, it's certainly meeting roughly on a a weekly basis uh, at the moment with uh, senior colleagues from University of York, York St John University, York College and Ascombe Bryan College, together with uh, key uh, colleagues from Council and NHS. It's also supported by uh, a more operational group uh, stretching across those institutions to look uh, at matters of detail. I think it's already a, 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 a useful forum for, for sharing uh, information on the various precautionary and preventative measures that all four institutions are putting in place. Uh, it's got a very strong focus also on test and trace, uh, and in particular, how we best align to a fast moving context where some of the parameters are, are shifting um, in, in often quite unexpected ways. Uh, for example, last week we, we, we saw a change of approach nationally on tracing, uh, which uh, which wound down some of the national capability and, and pointed towards an increased focus on local level uh, coordination and uh, and action. Um, with all of that in mind, uh, we are uh, preparing for a, a scenarios exercise uh, in in a bit less than a couple of weeks' time, uh, which would involve all of the educational and public health. Uh, partners uh, exploring how we would respond uh, collectively 
uh, to scenarios of differing levels of complexity from relatively isolated cases where we've got a clear idea where they came from to, to more complex ones which uh, stretched across the institutions and we weren't entirely clear uh, how things had started. Uh, beyond all of that, we've, we've had a particular uh, focus on testing, which is the, the main uh, issue in, in the paper that's before you uh, this afternoon. Uh, we, we thought we needed some criteria around this and we set out a number, which you can see at the start uh, of the paper. Uh, that's about capacity, having enough testing capacity for the scenarios we might need. Um, ensuring that we can test accurately, which is in large part a question of how the tests are, are administered. Uh, ensuring that we have speed of delivery of results. Uh, we, we have suggested that uh, we need results from tests within 24 hours. Um, in particular, because the, the social networks um, that, that students uh, have can be quite complex. Um, uh, and if we don't act quickly, um, we, we may find it difficult um, to, uh, to respond. Um, uh, we, we, we have a big concern about accessibility of, of testing to a student community and there are a number of barriers uh, here to overcome especially under pillar two which i'll uh, i'll talk about in a moment uh, and we wanted to ensure that we can have consistency across the the four institutions uh, this is um, uh, an evolving situation and will continue to change um, but, but i have to say the group's view is that we have um, uh, some real concerns about pillar two uh, testing. Uh, we of course have the drive-in centre at Poppleton, but that's of little use to students, most of whom don't have cars. Uh, we, we have some concerns about the, um, the conditions, the technical conditions for access uh, to tests, which may well exclude many students from being able to order a test. Um, this is one of the things that appears to be uh, evolving, but I don't think it's clarified yet well enough for us to be sure that, that a, a student needing a test could access one uh, quickly. Um, pillar two may, may rely significantly on home testing kits. Uh, we're worried about that. Uh, I think a 24 hour turnaround is impossible to achieve uh, with home testing kits. Uh, and we're also concerned about the accuracy of self uh, administration. Uh, we know that uh, self-administered tests are uh, often return false uh, readings because of the way in which they are taken. Uh, and we have a, a concern about capacity as well. Um, each autumn, many students present with temperatures and coughs. Uh, most of those are normal bugs. Um, some of them may well be COVID. Um, uh, and we, we, we're going to have to test every instance where we see um, those symptoms emerge. Uh, and, and frankly, from our knowledge of, uh, of, of what we call freshers flu, um, that the, the capacity that we have at the moment of 500 tests a day uh, could easily be uh, ab absorbed across uh, the institutions. So around pillar two, we have concerns about capacity, uh, accessibility, speed, uh, and accuracy. Now, it may well be uh, that we can secure improvement on all of those counts uh, in the coming period, but we don't have very long uh, until um, students uh, reappear in, in large numbers. Uh, the two further education colleges in York St. John start in the middle of September, the University of York a couple of weeks uh, later. That's not very far uh, from now. Um, and so we're, we're not convinced that these deficits in Pillar 2 will be all resolved by that point. For that reason, we're keen to explore Pillar 1, uh, working with York Hospital. Uh, we have a strong collaboration already. Um, the University of York supported uh, the, the COVID testing operation in York Hospital, uh, especially in that early part uh, of lockdown, both with equipment uh, and with, uh, with people. Uh, and York Hospital is keen uh, now and, and in future to collaborate with uh, our universities and colleges. 
Pillar one, of course, is normally for NHS staff and patients, though uh, we do know examples of university hospital collaborations elsewhere that have emerged as local solutions with pillar one testing uh, at significant uh, scale. Uh, and we're, we're very keen as a group to explore how we could embed something like that in, in a collaboration between the hospital uh, and the universities uh, and colleges. Uh, our view is that this would be more accessible, um, especially if aligned to campus-based swabbing sites uh, and coordinated delivery to uh, the hospital. Uh, those tests would be, um, I think, by definition, more accurate than uh, anything involving uh, self-administration. Uh, we'd be much better placed to achieve the, the speed of turnaround we think uh, we need. Uh, and I'm sure we can uh, uh, establish a real consistency across the service applied uh, to all four institutions. There is a challenge around capacity uh, and it's a challenge of two kinds. Uh, the first is that if we're in a more general outbreak situation, then clinical need um, will, will, will kick in. Uh, though I, I, I do stress in that situation that the University of York would be willing to do what it did in those early and more difficult days uh, in lockdown in lending equipment and people to make sure that we could uh, uh, serve, uh, serve the needs uh, of all concerned. Uh, the second problem is, is the one I wanted to raise particularly with, with you tonight, and it's about the supply of tests that could be used under Pillar 1 for the universities and colleges setting. Uh, that's not something that, that is the responsibility of the hospital, um, but which is, is allocated by the NHS regionally under the authorisation of the Department of Health and, and Social Care. Uh, and that's less easy to organise than a collaboration at the local level with the hospital. Um, we, we would like to um, uh, seek this board's support uh, in asking probably Keith um, to uh, write a letter to the appropriate authorities uh, asking that that supply of swabs could be uh, made available to your hospital for the purposes that I've outlined. I think that would give us uh, a much better basis uh, for meeting the potential challenges ahead than Pillar 2 certainly as currently uh, uh, organised uh, can do. Uh, and do remember, we don't have very long to get this in place. Uh, I'll stop there, Keith. I'm happy to, to amplify on any of those points. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Charlie. I'm very happy to take any other either questions to, to Charlie or supportive comments or input with, with others. And um, before I check Fiona, I don't know if there's anything you, you'd like to add. I know you've, you've been a member of that subgroup. Um, but on that that plan, and in, indeed whether I we should should write as a board to the Department of Health. Yeah, so I mean, I think Charlie's given a really good overview of um, you know just some of the complexities around this, and um, I, I guess my view is that you know there's a number of different options and routes into testing, and we probably want to be exploring them all and doing all that we can um, to make sure that we've got capacity, whether that's through pillar one or pillar two. What we've seen kind of all throughout this um, pandemic is that you know things change and develop, so we wouldn't want. I, I feel that we don't want to put all our eggs necessarily into one basket because if anything goes wrong with that we don't want to be in a situation where we're left without any route so we are um as um charlie said we are pursuing the pillar two as well and may and trying to increase that capacity from 500 a day uh, and we're working on that doing that now but if pillar one if a pillar one local um a route with the partnership in between the hospital and the university can be facilitated as well. I would be supportive um, of that. Um, also, we've been told nationally that every university city will have a walk-in um, testing centre um, and apparently Leeds uh, already has theirs up and running. So there will be other developments um, as well that come on uh, come online as we go through this. So I think for us, it's just about making sure that we um, pursue all of all the avenues that are open to us. Thank you very much. So just to check if anybody wants to make any 
comments. Um, Andrew. Thank you, Chair. Um, so let's just start by saying that we would certainly uh, support um, Charlie Jeffrey's view that we should try and improve access um, of tests for university students and that we look after and protect our university student community. Um, I'm a little bit guarded with regards to pillar one. Um, we all know, and this is from studies from around the world, that healthcare settings in particular were high risk um, for outbreaks of SARS. And uh, certainly earlier in the pandemic, um, a lot of the capacity for pillar one was used up to try and keep patients in hospitals safe. Um, and the tests were really important in that setting. We know that young adults, whilst they might be as um, of equivalent risk of spreading infection, they tend to have lower, um, uh, less, less severe outcomes than many of our patients who end up in hospitals with severe comorbidities and so forth. So whatever letter this uh, committee decides to write to the relevant authorities, I would um, counsel uh, that we take a measured approach because what we don't want to do is undermine the ability of the NHS to test those patients and staff at highest risk for whom uh, the test will make a very big difference in determining the clinical management of those patients. Uh, I'm sure that's something we can all agree on. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Don't know, uh, Charlie, did you want to come back first on that? If I may, and thank you, Andrew, I, I, you, you're, you're quite right. Um, and and let, let's be clear that um, what, what I'm arguing that we argue for is an increase in the supply uh, of, of testing capability to the hospital. Um, so not, not um, working within the current quantum of tests available, but increasing that quantum. Uh, so I, I wouldn't want to see that, that trade-off uh, happen. Uh, and, and you're quite right about student outcomes. You know, um, students, uh, if, if they test positive for COVID, uh, the statistics say that they will have, um, they'll probably barely notice it. Um, but that's that's not the the issue necessarily that we're we're, we're trying to control for. Uh, we are trying to control the situation for staff uh, in in all of our settings, uh, and of course our staff uh, are not all uh, bristlingly healthy uh, eighteen to twenty one year olds, uh, and and include a number of the of the more at risk uh, demographics, uh, and our students. Um, in in uh, our universities, uh, live in settings across the city um, and share facilities with uh, communities across the city. Uh, and uh, those students communi communi commuting into uh, colleges, into York St. John and to an extent to, to our university are of course um, commuting back and forth to uh, family settings where again, there may be uh, people in, in more vulnerable situations. Uh, so what I'm suggesting here is not, not simply a, a set of safety measures for students, uh, but a set of safety measures which uh, externalise the benefit uh, onto our communities. Thank you uh, very much. Um, Fiona, anything to, to add? And then I'll just go over the recommendation that's in front of us. Uh, I don't think I've got anything more to add to that. Thank you. Thanks. I'd just like to th firstly thank the, the members of the subgroup who I know have been doing a lot of work uh, to, to work in, in partnership to, together. And I think it's another good example of, in, in this case, education in the city uh, coming together to, to work for the good of their, their communities, but the wider uh, community, which is certainly uh, welcome from my perspective. Um, the, the paper that's in front of us had an, a number of recommendations within, uh, but there was that one particularly that's been discussed for the board to agree, um, which is that the Outbreak Management Advisory Board um, asked the, the council, and I'd be happy to do it, to write uh, to the DHSC requesting support to ensure that a consistent supply of swabs is made available to support testing. Um, but I think if we're, in, if we're minded to agree that, what we should should also mean it is to make sure that that is reflective of, of, of Andrew's comments 
um, in the, the 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 final letter that is sent. And I'm certainly more than happy to to get a draft sent to perhaps Andrew, Charlie, and Fiona for final sign off. Um, before we actually sent it in the in the name of the board, uh, if everybody was was happy with that, um, if you in a sense have any uh, counter proposals, uh, this is your chance to to indicate. Um, if not, I'll I'll ask if you could support that way forward. Um, so if I can I can see a, f a few nods. If I could see a nod or a hand, that would be fantastic. Thank you very much. Super. So it's a clear majority in favour and we'll get a draft to, to Charlie Andrew and, and, and Fiona to then go out on behalf of the board. Um, so uh, Claire is now back with us. Um, so hopefully the connection won't go down. Uh, and I said, Claire, that we would return to the communications item when you came back in. Thank you very much. And, and many apologies. I'm not sure what happened. You all froze. And then I realised it wasn't you, it was me. So apologies. Um, uh, Chris, thank you. So we talked about, um, we got to phase three where we've got an incident communications plan. Um, the head of communications group are going to review that incident communications plan and take lessons from actually putting it into practice over the last few months and seeing that we're ready for anything that comes um, forward in the future. If we'd like to go to the next slide, please. Just checking I'm still with us. Yeah. Oh. Right, I'll just I'll just speak you through it. So um, we are focusing on four key messages. Um, next slide, please. No, we're, focusing on four not, key messages. We're not having luck on communications, not, are we? It's got the gremlins. <laughs> um, the four key messages are um, unsurprisingly. Um, stopping the spread of the viruses in all of our hands. We have to wash our hands regularly, wear a face covering. If we get symptoms, get tested and socially distance um, two metres is best. And I'll pick up on face coverings shortly when I come on to an update on the face coverings task and finish group. Um, next slide, please, if possible. Thank you. So um, I'll just update you on activity that's happened more recently in phase one. So the regular updates that we're providing to try and prevent um, a spread. As I've said, we've we've shared um, briefings and updates regularly. I've got another one that's gonna go out to partners today with face covering social media posts to share through your own networks. Um, we've recently issued an Our City. This is a double page spread taken from the most recent version that went out. We've got another one coming out early um, early September. And then social media, we've run a Facebook Live Q&As and we continue to run those um, regularly um, with them linked, uh, previous ones linked from our website. The most recent one took place last night. Thank you to partners who were involved. Um, what came out very strongly from that one was uh, more clarity around face coverings in schools. So we'll take that as, a, as an action and feed that back into our planning for supporting schools to reopen. And I know we've got a session about that later. Um, if we'd like to go to the next slide. Um, so just to talk you through uh, these two communications objectives around building advocacy and building engagement. We work. We continue to work with different uh, partners and stakeholders to make sure messages are shared as widely as possible. Head of communications group we've talked about, the schools um, and education um, providers, universities and colleges we're working, we're part of the university group that um, we just talked about, business and voluntary sector, and then of course the face coverings group. Now the face coverings group is a new task and finish group. We initiated it following our last eight break management board. Um, it met last week for the first time. It includes a number of you partners. So thank you very much for joining the group. It's, we very much appreciate your support and definitely your insight. What came out really strongly was um, there is there is confusion. That confusion has been compounded by the government uh, changing legislation twice in as many weeks. Um, Pupil settings is a is an issue. Um, working with the, uh, the voluntary sector and how we can support charities and social enterprises, and and getting to a point of having one shared simple message that we can put out across all of our respective settings. Um, as I said, there is um, that confusion was demonstrated in the Facebook Live questions that we received from residents last night. Um, we've also had reports of some um, some aggression towards either shopkeepers and retailers or vice versa to 
to people in shops who are either not wearing face coverings or are wearing face coverings in the wrong place, except or is perceived wrong place. So there's another meeting of the task and finish group for face coverings tomorrow. And we'll continue to keep that cycle so that we get to a point where we've got really strong recommendations on how we can help people understand what they need to do and when is the right time to do that. In the meantime, um, other activity we've done. So we've built engagement by delivering different communi engaging communications over the last couple of weeks. Um, many of you were involved in the Facebook Live um, last night. We've issued joint press releases and statements. We continue to share our partner updates. There's another one going out today with more face covering information on. And as I've said, we're going to report back about our big conversation, um, temperature check feedback at the end of August with some recommendations. Um, and then if we'd just like to go to the, the next slide. Um, we are also starting to learn from others across the country and the world. So we're part of a weekly briefing session with the Cabinet Office, which takes place every Friday, where the Cabinet Office feedback on insight that they're gathering from across the country as to what's working and what isn't, particularly in terms of the tools and communications they provide. Current themes, as you can see, are the impact of the pandemic, how to manage local outbreaks. And there's been a number, as you know, including, for example, whether we should use the term local outbreak, um, how we tackle misinformation. Um, that's come to the fore again in the last week with um, a, um, a small group in York putting out misinformation that we've had to um, deal with. And then, um, like I said, we're going to work as a, as a partnership to explore what we could have done better through the incident itself. So I'll pause there, conscious that I'm, I've kind of lost sight of how much time I've got, given I came and went, so apologies. Um, and I, I don't propose going through the whole incident communications plan with you tonight. I just wanted to share it with you um, so you can see what the starting point is and what we did during the incident itself. But noting that we will be reviewing that with the head of comms group and then obviously evolving it as we go. A couple of things that have already come out about our incident management was making sure that we, we don't alienate or reinforce stereotypes. So, for example, we don't look like we're targeting information, particularly to, if you like, um, younger people who, who, you know, spread the spread the virus and don't listen to the advice because of course that in itself is a stereotype. We don't um, suggest that different um, community groups may be um, doing things that they shouldn't be doing or, or anything like that. So we take a, an inclusive approach to our communications. Targeting information if we need to, but not using the actual words or messages in a, a exclusive way. So pausing there, any questions? Thank you, Chris. Thank you uh, very much, Claire, for the, the, the presentation in two parts, um, which I think just gives us a, you know, a snapshot of a huge amount of work that's being done by the, the council comms team, but then mirrored, as you say, by health partners, education partners, community yeah, and voluntary sector in, in, in sharing and getting as consistent a message out there as, as possible. I'll certainly uh, be interested in that, that feedback that you get from, I think you called it a temperature check in terms of the, the, the feedback in what people uh, in, a, in a sense understand, don't understand, and therefore how we can target some of that communications over the coming weeks and months. Um, first question was Alison. Uh, hi, Claire. I think it's a fantastic comms plan, I have to say. You're doing a great job. Thank you uh, just much. a question about face coverings. Um, I'm hearing of a few instances where people with hidden disabilities are getting abused because they're not using uh, face masks. Um, and I just wonder, is that part of your, your planning, your campaigning, just to raise awareness of that? Because uh, it, it can be uh, quite unpleasant for people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I've got an echo now. Thank you very much for um, raising that. Yes, absolutely. The the first, the second task and finish group for face coverings meets tomorrow and we'll definitely feed that in. Thank you. Uh, very timely insight. Thank you. Thank you very much. I can't see any more questions at this stage. Um, and obviously we're just, we're just being asked to note uh, the communications update and then obviously we'll we'll receive the, the next update as you've suggested at the next uh, meeting. So thank you very much for, for that. Um, that then uh, takes us through, uh, because obviously we've done agenda item five now, straight to agenda item six, which is an update from the Health Protection Board, which is the internal officer level uh, board and I'm going to hand to Fiona to give us a brief update. 
Yeah, so um, just to, uh, this will be a very quick update really just in the pro pro um, process of setting that group up. So um, just for board members, if you remember when we uh, brought the outbreak control plan and um, to this uh, meeting we had a outbreak control plan management structure which kind of listed the various groups that would meet um, to provide our response um, in York and um, so below this group um, here we have a COVID-19 health protection board which is chaired by the director of public health and then under that group and um, there's the COVID-19 prevention and response group Group, which um, I oversee and it's members of the public health team uh, that lead on the seven themes within our plan. So our priority really up to this point has been to get that prevention and response group up and running and delivering on those seven themes. Um, and that work is well underway. Obviously, we've highlighted some of the work around universities and we'll talk about care homes in a bit. Um, but that's really been the focus um, of the work um, at the moment to get that operational response and those standard operating procedures for what we will do against all of those seven themes within our plan. Um, so then the COVID-19 Health Protection Board will provide that strategic overview of that work um, with relevant partners across York and they will have that first meeting at the end of September. One of the roles of that board will be to highlight any concerns about how the system as a whole is responding to COVID-19 um, and as a group of partners they would then work together to um, resolve any of those issues or for things that couldn't be resolved uh, to escalate those through to um, this group. So in some ways we all, almost need to give a little bit of more time for the system to work. We haven't really had to as yet um, put um, in, into practice our outbreak response in York to any sort of specific spikes or, or outbreaks in settings as yet. And obviously, you know, with most businesses just coming back online and then the schools and universities uh, coming back in September that feels like the right time to have the first meeting of that group. Um, I would also say just in terms of that um, role of that health protection board in terms of escalating any issues, obviously we are monitoring things on a daily basis. So uh, in absence of that group having met, I think it's um, safe to say as that there are no issues that we want to escalate at this point. There's, there's no areas of real concern for us in York. Um, but obviously, as we've said, some of it is still working work in progress but um, good progress being made on that so that's probably all I'd, I'd say on that at the moment. Thank you uh, very much uh, Fiona just to check if anybody's got any questions uh, for Fiona at this stage otherwise if we note uh, Fiona's update and I'm sure we'll, we'll receive more as that group gets up and going and um, thank you very much that then takes us on to agenda item seven, uh, which is the first theme in the outbreak control plan, safe opening of schools and early year settings. Uh, and Amanda's going to outline some of the details of how York will safely uh, open schools and early years settings. Amanda. Thanks, Keith. Evening, everyone. Um, I think it's really important to note that, that schools are doing the preparation for opening or wider opening in the context of carrying on with everything else that's happening in education at the moment. So um, you'll all be aware that it was A-level results last week, it's GCSE results um, tomorrow. So what you've got in your pack is a briefing note, which is an update on some of the themes and some of the work that, that all of the, the schools across the city and early years providers across the city are engaged in. It's a fast moving picture and obviously things evolve at, at pace. It's really important to remember, though, that there are two kind of key things that that are in place. Schools haven't closed in York. They have been open throughout the pandemic. And we've had high numbers of vulnerable children in schools across the city. And crucially, we haven't had an outbreak in any of the schools across York either. So the approach that we've taken, which has very much been one around prevention, and, and taking a, an individual school risk assessment based approach is the approach we're taking into the wider opening of schools in September. 
So each of the schools are working on very detailed risk assessments, which look at their buildings, the capacity in their buildings, the nature of the way that people flow throughout their buildings, their workforce, who's vulnerable in their workforce, who's previously shielded, how can that work effectively, the nature of the children that they have attending their schools and the patterns of attendance that, that would work for them, and also the transport and how transport will work effectively to get children into schools. There isn't a one size fits all because for each different group of children and for each different school, there will need to be a different approach, which is absolutely what the schools are doing in relation to that risk assessment. Those risk assessments have served us well so far, um, because as I say, we haven't had any outbreaks. And so we're continuing with the same model. Public health have worked very closely with the school and early years community as, as part of the work we've done so far and we're continuing to do going forward. So York Schools and Academies Board, which represents all of the schools in the city, um, including maintained schools and, and those that are academy schools, has been meeting three times a week. During the summer period, that's reduced, but they're still meeting regularly, meeting as an entire group, but also meeting in phases. So meeting secondary groups, meeting as uh, primary schools, and also meeting to look at spe special school issues, particularly. Public health have been very, very involved in those meetings and have supported the academy chains and head teachers to deal with very specific issues that relate to their schools, but also to share good practice across, across the schools. We've had a conversation today about face coverings and working on some, some additional guidance in relation to face coverings in schools, which is, is always going to be a balance between how can you effectively support children to get back to something that resembles a normal education context for them in which they can learn because what we do know is one of the best ways that we can help all of us but help children particularly come out of the other side of COVID is getting them back to school getting them back into education because the the benefits of that are, are very significant for their ongoing life chances versus kind of how do we manage the the, the situation in relation to safety and, and in relation to face coverings. We've also got for each of the each of the different phases, so schools, early years, settings, et cetera, standard operating procedures in relation to what do we do if we get a suspected case, what do we do if we get a suspected outbreak? And and they they've been co-created with the sector and, and are very straightforward in terms of you know making sure that everybody knows exactly what you'd do were, were we in those situations. The other thing that it's important to to consider is not just the logistics of how do you get children back into schools but also how do you support children back into being able to learn again so what you've also got in the briefing note is is some information about some of the work that we're doing over the summer period and and also to support children to engage in things like some of the cultural activities you've got examples of the doodle books that we've been doing some creative activities that we've been doing to help children to re-engage back into a learning context, but also to, to deal with some of the emotional impact of, of some of what will, will undoubtedly have been happening to them whilst, whilst they've been in this very difficult and different situation. And the schools are also working on what does that kind of transition curriculum look like? How can they support children effectively back in to re-engage and to learn? And, and the last aspect to the work that we've been doing, and it is very much linking into Claire's work, is around the comms around all of this. So lots of work around helping people feel safe for their children to return to school and doing things like the Q&A that, that we were doing last night. There's another one coming up at the beginning of September. It's really important on that so that people have got an opportunity to ask the questions that they want to ask, raise the concerns they've got. So, for example, in relation to face coverings, so that we can make sure we can get some, some clear messages out around that. So finally, um, all of our schools are working towards full opening from the first week in September, which is when they would have been open in normal circumstances. Um, all of them are working on their transport plans. Now, we meet weekly with Department for Education and are expected to report back on this to them each week. And also they, they want to know how many children are in schools in particular groups. So we'll continue to report that as we as we go through. And I think that's it. Questions?
Thank you very much, uh, Amanda. Any questions or comments on this? Uh, I'll go to Sally. Thank you. Um, I suppose it's just a request that um, when those standard operating procedures are um, finalised in terms of what happens if a child develops possible symptoms of COVID, it would be really helpful for some of that to be shared with primary care. Yeah. Because I think a bit of, a bit like we've already touched on tonight with fresh as flu for university students, I think there is highly likely to be um, a significant number of children developing viral infections consistent with COVID, but most likely not to be COVID. Yeah. And it would be helpful if we can give consistent advice because parents often will approach us for advice as to what to do, whether to keep the children off school or not. And if we've got mm -hmm. sad what those SOPs say, we can try and argue that clear message. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Makes you. Sense. I can see Amanda has, has agreed and hopefully we'll, we'll get those sent over for, for distribution. Um, Danny. Thank you, Chair. I've just got a couple of um, questions um, f for Amanda and, and based on the report and similar to, to what's just been mentioned. I, I think there's um, some concerns around mild symptoms in, in young people and the asymptomatic nature of, of COVID in, in young people. Um, so I just wonder how schools are, are advised to deal with um, that, that type of difficult diagnosis and, and what that would mean for uh, the bubbles within schools and, and the, the testing regime, if, if you like. Will uh, pupils, on what level will pupils with suspected symptoms uh, be sent home and, and tested? And, and similarly, will all the bubbles be sent home? Have we got a clear idea on, on that type of um, measure within the operational plans? Um, I think, uh, and, and similarly, uh, just to add, tack, tack on a little bit to that question, um, are we aware of how schools are going to deal with pupils with health issues that put them at personal, um, particular personal risk? Um, and also those from uh, BAME communities or, and or children from multi-generational households that are sharing home space with vulnerable persons. If, if you could outline some, uh, some thoughts on those questions, I'd be grateful. Yeah, um, on the first one in relation to, to managing symptoms, managing children that have had tests, there's, there's clear national guidance in relation to that, which is what we've, we've um, built the standard operating procedures on, basically. So there's, there's clarity around what do you do if a child has symptoms, which is basically you take them for a test, but at that point you, you are not sending a bubble home because you, you haven't got a confirmed case of COVID. And, and as we were... We've been talking about, you know, if it's a child who's got a cough and every child who had a cough meant that every bubble was then sent home, it would be not sustainable. So that isn't that isn't what's in what's in the, the guidance. Then it, it, there's detailed in relation to what happens if you have a positive test and what do you do in relation to the positive test? There's also detail in the guidance in relation to the use of PPE with with children who are symptomatic and and how that's managed in across a range of school contexts, be it in a special school, because clearly PPE use in a special school is different to PPE use in, in a mainstream school if you've got children that, that need more close, close procedure and processes. So all of those are co covered in the, in the um, guidance, which I think picks up some of your other issues in relation to um, children that have got additional needs and children that have got particular needs. And, and again, public health team have been working very closely with, with all of our schools because obviously children with additional needs will attend a whole range of schools. They don't just attend special schools, but also working with the special schools as well to look at individual children's needs and think about how we can best plan for those children, particularly in relation to transport and making sure we've got safe transport for those children as well. And, and have been doing that throughout the, the whole of the, the pandemic thus far, because obviously children in those groups are 
vulnerable children and have been able to access school places right the way through the pandemic. Um, so, so that's an area we've been working on. In terms of the multi-generational households, again, it's very much been around following the national advice. And I think that's what we, we are we are using is, you know, the, the, the national public health advice in, in those areas. Thank you. Don't know if you want to come back at all, Danny. Um, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I probably would. I've just got a couple of further questions um, that are more general that I, I would appreciate being able to ask. Um, and, and firstly, I should thank thank the council staff as well, and and obviously schools um, and everybody involved in in what is a really um, busy time, of course, for, obviously for all the work that they're putting in to, to maintain safety. I just wanted to ask about, it's something I've raised before, um, it's around universality of policy um, between schools within the city. And, and I just, I'm seeking assurance basically around the operational plans and if there are potential variances between schools and whether they may be starker between local authority maintained versus academy or if, if there could be if there could be differences between uh, schools due to socioeconomic factors um essentially i'm look, looking for the risk to be fairly balanced and and to ensure it's been assessed in in that way and then and then lastly uh chair if i may just a, a quick question around um potential closures of schools and who's got the power to to either do that or instruct schools to improve their risk management should they wish to do so. Um, the outbreak plan for this board suggests that the board can advise. Um, I'm, just, I'm just wondering, is it the director of public health that can restrict school numbers or potentially implement uh, a closure or, or, uh, or in a more minor way, ask for schools' risk assessment or operational plans to be implemented? Proved or more robust so just a couple of questions there and again i do appreciate um the responses and the work that you're doing so in terms of the the approach the the approach has very much been to take a a whole city approach all school community approach which is why YSAB have been so central to this so YSAB is york schools and academies board so there isn't a difference between what happens in maintained schools and what happens in, in academies. The, the board has worked incredibly well together as, as a very strong partnership through this process, sharing good practice, sharing ideas, sharing challenges, um, sharing resources, and, and that will continue. As it currently stands, um, all schools are anticipating that they will be fully open at that first week in September. So. We're not expecting to see a differentiation across schools and by phase or by or by type. Um, in terms of who has the power to say yay or nay, then it's head teachers and the school governing body. And and that again has been the approach that we've used thus far. That they they've been the people that have signed off the risk assessments. We've looked at risk assessments, but the risk assessments are very much the property of, of the school and the, and the governing body. And it's the head teacher and the, and the governing body who get to make the decision about whether or not that it's safe to open or not safe to open. Thank you very much. Um, I can't see any other hands or questions at this uh, point. So we're obviously just being asked to, to note um, the, in a sense, assurance report of some of the work going on uh, for schools and, and early years settings and I'm sure Amanda you you as a member of the board you can present to us again uh, and particularly um, during and after September uh, on all of the work that will be going on in school so th thank you for that and um, that then takes us on to uh, agenda item eight um, which again is picking up on on, on, on theme one in the outbreak uh, control plan, this time uh, around the ongoing work with uh, care homes. And I'd like to welcome Sharon Holden, um, who's the Corporate Director of Housing and, and Adult Social Care uh, to the meeting. And I think it's your fir first meeting of the board. So welcome yes. um, to present the report to us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the report is a really a short briefing note that you've had on the current position and 
a little bit of context and background on the considerable work that's been going on in the city in care homes since the pandemic broke and particularly during the, the um, emergency crisis response phase of the pandemic. So we've got to a position now in care homes in York um, where we have no current confirmed cases of COVID-19 with any care home residents in the city. And that position has been held since the 17th of July. The last time that we had a reported outbreak was on the 28th of June in the city. Um, so just really aiming to summarise for you how we've achieved this um, through the close monitoring and liaison that we have um, engaged in as a system with providers across the city. Uh, we've been proactively testing all residents and staff in care homes and obviously that testing programme has ramped up as and um, when government regulations around testing and availability of testing changed over previous months. Um, we've had daily um, liaison and daily working between colleagues and adult social care commissioning, the public health leads, CCG colleagues, really working together as a whole system. And all of our strategy and approach was detailed in um, in itemized in detail in our care home support plan. So you will remember that um, back in May, um, local authority areas and systems were required to submit care home support plans to the Department of Health and Social Care. Um, our care home support plan was coordinated by the council in consultation with our partners and it truly does represent a York system view. Um, we were focused in our plan on reducing admissions to permanent care and we have always promoted a home first model for discharge from hospitals. So in response to the pandemic and during our preparation for an expected surge in hospital admissions and the need to rapidly discharge non-COVID patients from hospital, we still remain steadfast in our commitment to getting people home so we didn't um, admit people to care homes in a very rushed and inappropriate way even during the pandemic period um, instead we commissioned significant additional home care support during that rapid response um, process and we developed new recruitment um, channels with our provider partners to achieve this and as a result of that we actually contained a number of admissions of admissions to care homes and made things much more stable and I think that's quite an important point to mention because it not only protects the market in terms of care home viability but it's really important as colleagues on the call will know to um, not admit people to care homes where in fact that level of care and that very particular type of care is not necessary um, across the whole system and very particularly working with primary care we're really committed to enabling people to remain as, as independent in their own homes as possible for all of their life um, and I think it's a real testament to the whole system in the city that we've managed to do this even during um, a pandemic emergency period. Um, We've developed our care home support plan uh, to call it team around the home. Um, so, for example, with our approach to safeguarding during the pandemic emergency, we allocated individual named social workers to each care home um, to coordinate any safeguarding con um, concerns or inquiries. So making sure that we were still meeting our statutory obligations, but having very specific named support for, for um, homes. Uh, so just to give you a flavour of what our care home support plan identified and focused on in summary. So as I said, established team around the home as an operating model model um, very robust monitoring from adult social care and um, in the council of the care home sector across the board including safeguarding um, we have a COVID-19 monitoring call hub run by volunteers for residents um, across the city and that includes um, queries about our care home um, facilities and care home residents we commissioned a 24 bed facility that provided short stay recuperation and recovery in a in a care home setting or residential setting for discharged COVID positive people who are coming out of hospital. Um, we expanded our Age UK home from hospital services with volunteers and that um, enabled us to um, develop our 
both our team around the home approach and also our enhanced community led support um, for people rather than care home admissions and our care home um, support plan was noted as an exemplar um, by the Department of Health and Social Care. So something else for the system in the city and city partners to be very um, proud of. Um, I think I probably would leave it there. The, the, um, the paper that you have received also details the infection control fund, which we have been given to support adult adult social care providers to reduce the rate of transmission um, in and between care homes. So that provides more detail on that and how providers have been able to use that grant and so enable the reduction of infection rates in care homes. And obviously those um, processes that we've developed during the pandemic emergency period will be ongoing and we will continue our regular and system wide engagement across the care home sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sharon, for the, the paper and that update. Any questions or comments uh, for Sharon at this stage? If if not, thank you very much, Sharon, for, for that. And I'm sure sim similarly to, to, to Amanda, we might well welcome future reports. And I know um, from uh, in, in Fulford, I get regular updates from uh, Fulford Nursing Home and I know the significant work that particularly staff are doing on the ground and in communities to, to support residents and across the system. So I'm sure we'd all like to thank them uh, for that and the wider social care uh, community. Um, on, on that, um, we can then move on to agenda item uh, nine. Um, and agenda item nine is the COVID-19 contain framework, a guide for local decision makers. Um, and uh, Fiona is gonna present this to us um, and links were included in the agenda papers uh, to the uh, government guidance in this area, uh, Fiona. Yeah, so uh, it's just really to give board members a bit more of an understanding around what can and can't be done, really, both at a national and a, a local level. Um, so I'll start off first with what's possible in terms of local lockdowns um, enforced by government and then what we as a local authority would be able to do. Um, so a local lockdown is when either some of all the protective measures are put back into place uh, in order to control the spread of the uh, virus in a specific locality, or it could mean the kind of easing of restrictions is delayed. So for example, not opening certain premises or businesses um, as quickly as originally announced. Um, and the aim of really doing that is to control the spread of virus um, by uh, containing the pandemic in a certain area so that you avoid having to go into that kind of lockdown across the whole country. Probably um, one of the you know more known examples of that is what happened in Leicester and parts of Leicestershire uh, and since then we've seen some of those local restrictions in areas such as Luton, Greater Manchester and parts of um, West Yorkshire and East Lancashire. Um, so in terms of how um, that happens at a national level, so various data sources are assessed by the Joint Biosecurity Centre together with Public Health England and NHS bodies. And then those data reports are assessed by the government's Local Action Committee Command. And then any issues of concern from that group are raised through to the chief medical officer and then as necessary to the health secretary. So um, in England, uh, if you have councils who've got a high number of cases or are showing a rising trend in the rate of cases, those areas then get designated nationally as either being an area of concern an area where enhanced support is needed. So for example, they might put in um, extra testing capacity to that area and then areas of intervention. And that's uh, where the additional um, restrictions uh, such as closure of premises might be introduced. So um, 
local um, in local authorities in England who are designated as being an area of concern or an area of enhanced support can then additionally uh, look to put in um, their own restrictions and that's what I'll come to talk about in a minute but basically that level um, that comes down nationally um, based upon what we've seen in other areas they tend to be things like putting in restrictions about um, not being able to meet other people in indoors uh, either in your home or other people's home things like not being able to meet in public outdoor spaces um, with other people outside of your um, household but basically those um, national restrictions that have been imposed have been in response to what was felt within an area has led to an increase in cases so that the directed at um, the source um, of the issue really. So in terms of then what we might be able to do um, as a local authority in our area, there was new legislation that was introduced in July, which means that a local authority could restrict access to or close individual premises. We could prohibit certain types of um, certain events or types of events from taking place uh, and we could restrict access to or close outdoor places or types of outdoor places. Now, if we were going to do that, we would have to demonstrate that three conditions have been met. So those conditions are as we need to be able to show that that any direction to um, restrict um, access to premises has to be in response to a serious and imminent threat to public health within our area. We have to demonstrate that the direction is necessary in order to prevent and protect against the spread of the virus. And we also have to uh, demonstrate that any restrictions we put in place are a proportionate means of achieving that outcome. So as a local authority, we would need to have evidence to show that those conditions have been met. And um, you would expect that in order to have that evidence, we would be in one of those three categories nationally assigned that I mentioned earlier. The guidance also says that the Director of Public Health must be consulted before any restrictions are put in place. Um, and also, um, we would then have to, if we decided that that was a route that we wanted to go down, um, we as a local authority, we would firstly have to consult uh, with the police around that. And then we would also have to communicate what we plan to restrict and why uh, to the Secretary of State. Uh, and any restrictions uh, that we put in place, we would have to review those every seven days. Um, just probably worth mentioning, based on the previous conversation, there are certain premises um, and places that are exempt uh, from those guidelines. So any kind of buildings that are part of the national infrastructure um, are exempt and that does include educational establishments. So we couldn't as a local authority um, impose a, a closure of schools uh, as, as an example, as, as we previously discussed, that would be down to schools and um, local governing bodies on, on a local level. Um, so hopefully that gives just a brief overview of what is possible at a national and a local level. And, and as you say, the links to the full guidance are in the agenda pack. Thank you very much uh, for that, Fiona. Um, any questions or comments uh, from uh, board members? Um, presum presumably, uh, Fiona, at, at some point, um, this can come back to the board um, once that guidance, in a sense, has been analysed a little bit more um, as a written note, perhaps as part of one of your other sort of situation updates in York. Yeah, we can do that. That, that would be great. And obviously, if anybody's got any questions outside of this meeting, I know they can always send send them through to you out, outside of the call. So thank you very much for that um, update, Fiona, um, which then takes us to agenda item 10, uh, which is items for the next uh, agenda. We agreed at the uh, first meeting um, that we're always going to have three standing items, uh, the current situation in York, communications and, and updates from any subgroups. 
uh, particularly universities, higher education and, and face coverings. Um, if anybody has any particular suggestions for, for additional topics, feel free to, to, to raise them here. If not, if you could um, send them through to Tracy Wallace um, outside of this meeting, or if you think of any afterwards, we'll make sure that that's featured on the, the work plan uh, for future meetings. Um, so I can't see any hands at this moment. Um, so, but as I say, happy to take uh, submissions afterwards. Um, and then agenda item uh, 11 is dates of future meetings. Hopefully you've had the, the invites uh, and they're on the 9th of September and the 21st of October, uh, both starting at half past five. Uh, if, you, if you haven't had the invite, shout and we will make sure that you uh, get them. So it, it, all I'm asking is for us to note the, the dates of the future meetings. Um, and then agenda item uh, 12 is any other business. Um, I've not been uh, told of any. So unless anybody uh, waves madly uh, at a screen uh, now, um, I'll assume that we, we haven't got any. I'd just like to, again, thank everybody for, for coming along, participating, and for those watching um, uh, along at home. Uh, and obviously, I'll see you all at the next uh, Outbreak Control Advisory Board. Uh, thanks very much.